And so with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Peter Hobbins. Uh, Peter Hobbins is our keynote speaker uh, for today. Uh, he is um, a principal historian of Artifact Heritage Services, uh, but is a, an affiliate at the University of Sydney, uh, a DECRA fellow and a professional historian who's reflected on various aspects of medical history, uh, which we'll come to appreciate today. Peter's going to set the scene for us, offer a conceptual framework to think about this time in a historical context. And Peter, I welcome you to the stage. So thank you. Your Excellency, the Governor, uh, President, fellows, members of the Royal Society, friends and colleagues. It really is a true honour to be addressing you here today, and particularly to take part in this forum in what's turned out to be a truly historic year. And I'm particularly pleased to join uh, my fellow historians here, Richard Waterhouse, Roy McLeod, and Warwick Anderson. Uh, and as well, I'd like to thank Susan in particular for your warmth and generosity in helping set up the forum today. Now, historians have spent this year hearing that 2020 was unprecedented. Now, most of us have argued against that reading of the year, and what instead we've tended to argue amongst ourselves about is what are the most appropriate historical parallels? Was it medical in terms of prior pandemics, political in terms of crises, particularly uh, state and Commonwealth politics, or was it economic? Should we be looking back to the Great Depression or the Second World War and the transformations they made in our economy? Although I'm no longer at the university, for instance, I was asked to participate in over 60 television, print and radio interviews in the first half of the year, precisely because of my potential to contribute to these historical debates, particularly because of my knowledge around the impact of pneumonic influenza or Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919. Now, curiously enough, I'm not really gonna talk about Spanish flu today, but I'm gonna park that so that you can ask me about it during the question time if you wish. I've been asked lots of questions about it this year. Instead, what I'm gonna do is take us back to a different moment of medical crisis, to an address delivered to the Royal Society of New South Wales in 1894 by its outgoing president, Thomas Anderson Stewart, who was the professor of physiology in the University of Sydney. Now, Anderson Stewart was alarmed in 1894 at the epidemics that were rolling out across the colony of New South Wales particularly uh, measles and scarlet fever, which he predicted had infected about 36,000 residents, or about 3% of the state's population. And he was particularly alarmed by the outbreak of diphtheria in Cowra, which infected about 30% of the population and had a case fatality rate of 13%. Now, just to put them into context, measles, scarlet fever and diphtheria were all notorious killers of children in that era. And so he was alarmed, as you can see on the quote on the slide here, that these epidemics had practically overrun the whole colony. But he was also looking for a solution. And Anderson Stewart came up with the suggestion that really we, need, we needed in this colony to have increased compulsory powers of notification of infectious diseases, of enforced isolation of victims and their contacts, and also disinfection, mandatory disinfection of their properties as well. And in making those claims, he looked both to recent American and English history in order to inform what he urged that ended up emerging as the Public Health Act of New South Wales in 1896. It also interestingly increased the powers of the Board of Health. And I just walked past the old building on Macquarie Street this morning and found that up there it says 1894 was when they were incorporated. So clearly Anderson Stewart and his cohort had some clout, even in concrete terms. But Anderson Stewart was also open to the new science of immunology. In particular, he was aware that in that era, a new vaccine against anthrax had been rolled out and tested in a herd of 50,000 sheep. Now, normally anthrax in this era, you would expect to kill between 20 and 30% of an infected flock annually. This vaccine reduced that number to two sheep. But Anderson Stewart was also aware of the galloping uptake in the community of another form of active immunity. And he spoke about the fact that residents in country districts of New South Wales were actively immunising their dogs against the poison of the paralysis tick. And they were doing that by deliberately attaching the tick to their dogs 
until the dogs develop the preliminary symptoms of paralysis, and then repeating that process several times until, as he said, the dog is protected. But in Sydney, the story was rather different. Sydney's residents had historically manifested low rates of vaccination against smallpox. And yet the disease smallpox was as deadly in humans as anthrax was in cattle, particularly in the form that was pandemic in the late 19th century. It would regularly kill about 20% of its human victims. And yet here in Sydney, in fact, just up the road on, uh, at Hyde Park Barracks, we were producing a vaccine. We've been producing a vaccine since 1847. Uh, it had been distributed through the city and through the country at a nugatory fee, and yet it was only really ever sought out when there were epidemics active in the town. So in this moment of crisis in 1894, Anderson Stewart faced a dilemma. Should he look forwards or should he look backwards? He could have urged for research to extend this new technology of vaccines from animals into humans, for local development of a measles or a scarlet fever or a diphtheria vaccine, and certainly diphtheria ended up being the flagship serum therapy of the late 19th century. But instead, he urged for the expansion and the consolidation of the colony's various public health laws and powers that were, invest that were vested in bodies like the Board of Health. But what Anderson Stewart particularly urged was a challenge to what he saw as the negligence, particularly of local authorities. In the 1890s, it was local councils who were primarily responsible for the health of our community. And he argued that what we have to contend with is not so much any real opposition, as so much as apathy and ignorance. So in other words, Anderson Stewart was urging for the preventive power of knowledge. And certainly knowledge was foundational to the Philosophical Society of New South Wales. In fact, one of the society's very first acts back in 1821 had been to visit the southern shores of Botany Bay and to erect a tablet to James Cook and Joseph Banks, who they said had been ardent in their pursuit of knowledge at that very location in 1770. But the Royal Society, members who you see on your screen there, embodied at this moment the 19th century's unwavering faith in progress. And they, and you see, they were all gentlemen, very much a male preserve, they were gentlemen of learning, leaders in business, in bureaucracy, in pastoralism, in the priesthood, and in the small cadre of academics in the colony at the time. And most of them shared a positivist belief in the power of empirical, verifiable evidence to guide their opinions and their future actions. And in fact, in the 19th century, history was regularly seen as a science, but it was seen as a science with a message. It could provide personal inspiration, but it could also provide professional precaution, particularly by learning from the past. And it was in that moment of Banks and Cook's encounter with Australia in 1770 that Edward Gibbon began publishing the volumes of his, the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, which overall provided a warning against the dissipation of empire and hubris. And in fact, the very first volume of that, very opposite to today, was published in 1776, the same year that uh, Britain's American colonies broke free of the mother country. Now that American Revolution sparked what historians have often called a long, a long century of change. Uh, but of course, the term revolution itself implies not a progressive view of history, but a circular view that comes back to its point of origin. And in fact, if you look very closely at the logo of the Royal Society of New South Wales, you'll find that it includes a, an Ouroboros, or the serpent swallowing its tail. So in fact, that circular view of history is embodied in the very logo of this society. But nevertheless, in the 19th century, we saw the development of progressive views of history. I mean, progress really was the narrative that propelled the 19th century. In 1859, Charles Darwin saw natural history as an endless series of developmental steps in response to endless environmental change. And writing in the same epoch, Karl Marx urged the study of the deep structures of history in order to understand its patterns, but more pointedly, for the teleological end of actually intervening in history and attempting to guide human society to what he saw as the perfect state of organisation. 
Now, it's not my role today to give you a, an overview of uh, two centuries of meta-historical debate, but I think it's worth pointing out that really those two key positions have tended to drive the way that many of us have seen history afterwards. We either see the past as providing an object lesson in errors that we should avoid, or we see it as establishing entrenched patterns that we can again learn from and finesse to suit future circumstances. And just one example of that comes from uh, Colonel Hubert Foster, who we see in the slide here. He said in 1914 that there'd be, there need be little doubt, but that the future will bear out the past. Now, Foster was the director of military science in the University of Sydney, but ironically, his 1914 book, War and the Empire, had a delayed release because of the outbreak of the war that we later came to call the war to end all wars. Now, speaking of ends, uh, of course, the end of the First World War saw uh, the advent of the pneumonic influenza pandemic. But this year, I think we've also seen a war on, particularly on the humanities and the social sciences, but against all forms of institutionalised learning in this country. And so, of course, for those of us in history, there's been an urge to rationalise the heuristic value of history. Why do we study it? How do we go about doing that? What can we learn from the lessons of the past? And historian of technology, Scott Knowles, has written about the importance of history in moments of crisis as well. And he says, if we fail to study past calamities as historians, then others will do it for us without the insight and the long view that we hopefully as a profession can bring to studying it. But Knowles is talking about knowledge. And even in 1894, Anderson Stewart knew that knowledge alone was not enough to overcome the inertia of the everyday. And so really part of my challenge today is set the scene for the hermeneutic challenge of operationalising insights for the future from a world that no longer exists. So what I'd like to propose as my challenge to you today is a variant reading of history and for us to consider it as a form of acquired immunity. So somewhat in the nature of tick poison, to think about aspects of the past as both a threat to our future but also as a potential agent for the efficacious prophylaxis of the repeat of those unpleasant patterns, whereby appropriate exposure might stimulate a proactive defence against the recurrence of unhealthy patterns into the future. And there's a certain irony here as well, that in 1894, Anderson Stewart was talking about country folk immunising their animals by attaching poisonous ticks to them. Well, it was only in 1934 that another University of Sydney scholar, Ian Clooney's Ross, actually generated the first uh, protective anti-tick serum. Uh, and really the forgotten hero of his story, as we see on the screen here, is Topsy the Immune Airedale, who was the signal animal or the patient zero, I guess, in that process in 1934. So over the next sort of 25 minutes or so, what I want to do is explore three case studies drawn from the histories of science, technology and medicine. And I'm particularly going to focus on snake bite and its remedies, on aviation accidents and on epidemics, three of the major fields that I've studied as a historian. So let's start with snakes. And don't worry, for those of you who are lifting your feet up off the floor at the moment, this is only one of two slides that feature snakes in them. Now, in 1788, when the colonisers first arrived on this continent, they realised quite quickly that they had little to fear from the terrestrial apex predators, the dingo and the thylacine. And at first they also thought that Australian snakes were innocuous. But by about 1810, they'd come to acknowledge that venomous serpents in Australia were perhaps the most serious natural threat to their existence. Sadly, they steadfastly ignored Aboriginal natural knowledge and healing systems and had to learn the hard way about which snakes to avoid and how best to treat their bites. And so over those early decades of European colonisation, the settlers developed their own set of folk knowledges and healing practices, which included the use of animals to study which snakes were venomous and also which remedies might be efficacious. Now, most of those antidotes tended to be applied locally to the bite site and they tended to treat the symptomatic aspects of the snake bite. And they ranged quite variously. So they included cutting the bite site, sucking out the venom, putting gunpowder into the bite site and exploding it, tying a tourniquet between the bite site and the heart and the brain. They might involve trying to keep the patient awake by flagellating them, by frog marching them, by shocking them with electrical batteries, or they might 
require the administration at the bite side of one of the many uh, local folk remedies. But above all, what both doctors and colonists favoured was their copious administration of stimulants, especially brandy. Cheers. <laughs> now, these were all folk remedies that had developed over decades. But by the 1850s, a slow progress was being made in the development of scientific inquiries. And certainly members of the Philosophical and later the Royal Society of New South Wales were at the forefront of developing these scientific approaches. Having said that, most practitioners through this period continued to publish individual case histories. In other words, unsystematic anecdotes, which really had very little theory attached to them as well. That was seen as the advance of medical knowledge up until the 1860s. And it was really in that moment that we start to see envenomation, envenomation participating in the transformation of the ideas of scientific medicine in the Australian colonies. And what led the way was these two remedies. Firstly, the intravenous injection of ammonia, followed later on by the subcutaneous, subcutaneous administration of strychnine. Now, you may be wondering why colonists would inject themselves with these notorious poisons. Well, because they had the evidence from the 1870s to the 1890s. Each of these poisons saw at least 100 case studies, most of them positive, published in the medical literature in support of their clinical use. And so at an individual level, both patient and practitioner, the evidence was before their eyes. Injecting these stimulants brought patients who'd been snake bitten back to life. But together, those 100 case studies also provided a collective history that they could look back to and apply to the next patient who walked in their door or called them to their home. So both of these remedies saw widespread lay and medical adoption until they were finally discredited in the final decades of the 19th century by two new medical approaches, vivisection or animal experimentation and medical statistics. So we reached the point in 1894 where Anderson Stewart, addressing the Royal Society of New South Wales, can affirm that these new approaches to medical science were instrumental in overturning centuries of practice based on the testimonial histories provided by individual practitioners. And as a physiologist, naturally, he said that only physiological study would deliver a rational method of treatment for snake bite. And he was amply rewarded by his demonstrator at the university, Charles Martin, who summarily dismissed the 400 prior studies published on snake bite in Australia in order to conduct his own thoroughgoing laboratory investigation, particularly into the venom of the red-bellied black snake, Pseudecus porphyriacus. And in fact, Martin's studies were so extraordinary that he won the 1895 Medal of the Royal Society for his work. Although, and I think our honorary historian of the society, Anne Coote, might uh, disagree with me here, I don't believe Charles Martin was ever actually a member of this society. But Martin was also a pioneer in the emerging field of immunology. And in fact, he pioneered the first antivenine developed against snake bite in this country, against the black snake in 1897. It proved to be both highly targeted and efficacious against the bite of this snake. And so Martin proved that it was technically feasible, but also he argued that the wide scale production and distribution of it was beyond the state of infrastructure in this country at that time. And you can see the consequences of that playing out in this 1906 letter from Western Australia, which shows that much as antivenines or antivenoms were a technological advance, they weren't available. So practitioners were forced to fall back upon remedies that had been discredited a decade earlier. And I'm re reminded here one of my favourite historians, David Edgerton, and his work, uh, The Shock of the Old, where he argues that novelty in technology rarely overcomes the inertia of the everyday. And that we really find through this series of rhythmic innovations in snake bite treatment throughout the 19th century, that both practitioners and patients alike often had to dismiss the latest remedies in order to fall back on something they believed was still efficacious. Now, if that's one form potentially of this Im uh, immunity from history, let's, mean on, let's move on to a very different form. Now, novelty can be problematic, but it can also, of course, drive dramatic change. And I think one of the most extraordinary changes in our society in the 20th century was the development of aviation. And yet, interestingly enough, the, avi and interestingly enough, the aviation industry itself is one of the most ardent embraces of the idea of history as pedagogy. 
So not long ago, for instance, the Directorate of Defence Aviation and Air Force Safety, try saying that quickly three times, um, published a series of books in which they argued that aviators needed to be constantly reminded of the circumstances of past crashes because, quote, those lessons can be applied today. And the risk landscape of aviation is regularly depicted in Darwinian terms. So expert Graham Braithwaite, for instance, has said, quote, that safety is not a utopian state which can be reached. It's a continuing battle against ever-changing threats. Darwin would have been proud. The aviation industry also has a voracious appetite for reading accident investigation reports in order to closely study the errors that occur in them. And I think the industry really has to be lauded for the extraordinary reach of its forensic investigations, which account for technological, environmental, systemic and human factors in trying to understand the root causes of accidents and address them. But Historian of science Peter Gallison has argued that this approach in itself creates an insolvable dialectic between attempts to localise the cause of accidents in specific events, decisions and artefacts, and the diffusion of causality across systems, environments and technological developments. We can't always solve aviation accidents. So on the slide here, for instance, you see the wreckage of Australia's last major airliner accident, a Vickers Viscount that crashed just south of Port Headland on New Year's Eve 1968. Now we can say why the airliner crashed. A hole drilled in the wing spar led to the failure of that wing in flight and unfortunately all 26 people on board died. But what the investigators couldn't explain was who had drilled that hole in the wing spar, why they'd done it or when they'd done it. So in fact the actual origin of that crash has never been established. And although that's a tragic tale, I think more broadly we need to take the lesson that that last major crash occurred more than half a century ago. And Australia actually has an incredibly proud record of aviation safety, particularly since the 1950s. Now, from some of the archival data I've collated in my DECRA project, you can see that there's enormous variability in accident rates over time. This is fatal accidents per 10,000 hours flown in both uh, military and in regular public transport, uh, regular passenger transport aviation. Uh, you can see it's very variable, but the trend is very clear. You can certainly see there are enormous disparities in the risk environments of military and civil aviation. And as a former pharmacologist, I can say that I'm also tempted to see what's sometimes called a, a, a shifting of the curve to the right as well. It looks to me like the military aviation has learned from those errors of civil aviation, but with rather greater amplitude and rather a delay in the process. But it's always dangerous to draw those analogies from patterns in a graph. I think also we need to remember that this, the data in this slide are both incomplete and contestable within themselves, but also that they exclude other major contributors to risk in aviation, particularly the agricultural aviation sector, crop dusters and the like, as well as newer technologies like gliders and helicopters. But nevertheless, the aviation industry really operates on the concept of virtuous cycles. They come back to the Ouroboros again. That they study accidents and incidents precisely to identify and ameliorate flaws in the system. And those flaws and the avoidance of them can then be operationalised in the design, the maintenance, the training, the operations and the supervision systems that they apply back into the industry. And now I'm sure none of us want to look out of our cabin window and see an image like this. And yet this is a, a photo taken out of a Qantas flight, an A380 that took off out of Singapore in 2010, QF32, many of us will probably remember it, where one of the engines exploded in flight and shot wreckage through the aircraft structure. Now the survival of that aircraft and all passengers on board, I think was attributed to two main things. Firstly, the intensity of the training of the crew, particularly their professionalism in a crisis, but also the fact that the aircraft itself was protected by its very design. So the structure of the A380 actually was set up in such a way that an uncontained engine explosion actually caused minimal damage or that there were multiple systems of redundancy built in so that the damage caused was not terminal. And that lesson in aircraft design itself was born out of similar uncontained engine fails that were documented in the 1970s and 1980s. 
So as in medicine, though, the, the reliance of practitioners on history can also create perils. So one of the one of these Australia's experts in the industry, Alan Hobbs, no relation, um, was concerned, for instance, to address what he saw as an axiom that had developed in the aviation industry, which was that increasing technological reliability would lead to a proportionate increase in the number of accidents blamed upon human factors. So what he did is he went back and he studied 100 accidents from the early era of civil aviation in Australia, 1921 to 1932, and he compared them with a cognate sample published in 1996. And Hobbes found that a similar proportion of accidents could be attributed to human error, 68% then versus 72% in the 90s. Seems a no-brainer. But I would argue that his sample was flawed and that, statistic, uh, that presumptive historical stability wasn't there. Through my own studies, I've looked through longitudinal archival data from 1921 to 1975 and found that there's extraordinary variability in the rate of accidents attributed to human factors, seesawing between 31% and up to 85% over time in both civil and military contexts. So how has the aviation industry progressed? Well, historian of te technology John Downer has argued that in fact one of the, uh, sort of ironically, one of the reasons for the success of the aviation industry in reducing accidents is its inherently conservative nature. And he argues that aircraft designers have developed their own immunity from history as he says, by consecrating traditions and building on the hard-earned wisdom of their predecessors. And certainly if you look at the overall design of a modern airliner like an A380, it's very similar to, say, the Boeing 707 and the DC-8 that were introduced in the late 1950s. Now, ironically, my own study of aviation accidents and my DECRA project was interrupted by a pandemic, not coronavirus, but by Spanish flu or pneumonic influenza. <laughs> And it was interrupted by me, really, because I felt this urge to encourage community historians, local, family and special interest historians, to undertake their own studies of how that pandemic a century ago played out locally across Australia. And so certainly in the scheme that I put together and rolled out through the Royal Australian Historical Society in 2018 and 2019, I did discuss pandemic planning. And I certainly did deal with an amount of media interest in a long forgotten pandemic. But what I wasn't prepared for was the vigour of the media interest in that pandemic 101 years later. And so certainly this year, I certainly haven't been alone in amongst historians and being asked to relate the stories of past pandemics, but also much more uncomfortably to prognosticate on the future of this one. And that was a challenge faced, of course, by Anderson Stewart back in 1894. You know, but if he aimed to alleviate pan epidemics in Sydney, he had actually very little positive history to guide him. It's true that since he'd arrived in the colony of New South Wales in 1882, there'd been major developments in sanitation across history. Better sewerage, the provision of clean water, the removal of refuse on a regular basis, and the displacement of noxious trades away from centres of population to the periphery of the city. But Anderson Stewart wasn't that worried about pandemics. He said nothing about the recently uh, ended Russian flu pandemic of the early 1890s, nor did he appear to see any major threat from the third pandemic of bubonic plague that was starting to take off around the Indian and Pacific Oceans in the late 1890s. But he did see what was before him across the colony, those diseases that regularly killed children, measles, scarlet fever and diphtheria. But he was also always aware of smallpox as well, and I think that's a really long forgotten pandemic from that period. Now, before Anderson Stewart's memory and his eyes was the fact that most previous pandemics had been ended in several ways. They'd either been self-limiting, in other words, they'd infected every possible patient and had basically burned themselves out, or they'd been managed either by containment, particularly quarantine measures, or by calamities like the Great Fire of London. Now, you can see from these slides here, fairly typical presentations of a more severe end of smallpox infection, that the disease, even if it was survivable, was left people with an enduring trace of its impact, but it also certainly posed a mortal threat, up to 20% mortality. And Michael Bennett just this year has published a really salutary reminder of the importance and the tragedy of smallpox in the late, nine, uh, late 18th century, but also of the rise of this extraordinary new technology, vaccination, from 1796 until about 1810. It circled the globe 
and really heralded a dramatic transformation in the way the medical practice and or medical profession and the community almost universally started to think about infections to some extent. One of the problems with vaccination was that it remained the only viable human exemplar through the entire 19th century. It was created by inoculating patients with a mild disease, cowpox, in the hope that it would stimulate their immune system to help protect them against the much more severe smallpox. But vaccination itself had grown out of an earlier practice known as variolation, whereby patient or uh, healthy people were inoculated with what was believed to be a mild version of smallpox in the hope that it would prevent the more severe manifestations. And of course, it didn't always play out that way. But by the end of the 19th century, this emerging science of immunology really threatened, promised really, to provide an unparalleled upheaval in the mode, the scale, and the politics of preventing disease. And as Anderson Stewart himself knew in 1894, the animal data that he saw in sheep flocks, for instance, and also in settlers' dogs, were promising. But here in Sydney in particular, vaccination through the 19th century had had a long and fractious history. We in this colony and then in this state never adopted compulsory vaccination laws, unlike, say, Victoria, Tasmania, or New Zealand. And one consequence of that was that smallpox vaccination was actually had a fairly poor uptake through most of those periods, except when we had outbreaks in the city, such as 1876 and 1881. And then we saw a dramatic clamour for vaccination, but it was always ephemeral, that it passed within one to two years. And ultimately, both of those major outbreaks in the city in the late 19th century were overcome by maritime and municipal quarantines, in other words, forcibly detaining people in institutions or in their homes. And so this was the dilemma that Anderson Stewart faced in 1894. Should he urge technological progress or should he point to recent historical successes? He could encourage the idea of herd immunity through mass vaccination and development of new vaccines against these uh, prevailing pandemics. Or he could face the fact that Sydney's residents resisted being herded into institutions. And they'd certainly complained loudly about that in the Royal Commission into the smallpox outbreak of 1881. Now, Anderson Stewart in 1894 said that this was very much, as he called it, distinctly a poor man's question. But who was he speaking to? The gentleman of the Royal Society of New South Wales. And in that circumstance, he made calls, political calls, for vigorous laws that were founded on what I guess you could call a double immunity from history. Firstly, the immunity born from the pragmatic knowledge that diseases had recently been defeated through the development of public health laws and their enforcement, but also political immunity born out by using the past as an arbiter of speaking for the future. Now, all of us every day operationalise history. We use the data from the past to shape the rational decisions that we hope we make. And I think if we were to think about this concept of immunity from history, then really I would argue that it's largely not conscious, but it's attitudinal. In other words, it's a subconscious adoption of many of these ideas of learning lessons from the past. And so both the pattern and the prototype models can play out in shaping professional cultures, industry standards and political processes. But also the idea of this immunity from history can also shape our normative assumptions about what's possible, what's desirable and what's just in our society. That belief in the protective power of history doesn't need to be overt, but like any tradition, it runs the risk of proving to be reactionary. In aviation safety, I think we could see that a degree of conservatism isn't necessarily retrograde. It's contributed to our extraordinary and world-admired aviation safety record. In the case of snake bite remedies in the 19th century, it's a bit more problematic. But there's a sort of an unhealthy allure of past practices that have proved to be discredited, but were the only thing that was seen to be able to fall back on when the latest advancement stalled. In the context of epidemics, though, and I guess this is where I'll tail off into the rest of our discussions today, we have to think about immunity from the past as informing both the politics of managing those epide epidemics as well as the promises of knowledge emerging from them. And finally, I'll just close out on thinking about the issue of scale and about how it's intrinsic to conceptualising this idea of immunity from history. 
So all of us embody larger lessons into our everyday decisions. And of course, we will refer to our own proximal and personal histories as well. And to just give one final example, medical diagnosis, when each of us attends a clinician, begins with them taking an individual case history. But the protective value we see of going to the doctor is informed by their prognosis and their treatment options, which are informed by learning from the collective histories of hundreds or thousands of patients who preceded us. So if those models and examples from history remain critical to our everyday decisions, then perhaps we can foster some sense of immunity from these unhealthy patterns of the past. But of course, as a historian, I'm going to say that we require people like me and my colleagues here to undertake a more critical analysis of the way we use those histories. And our challenge, I think, in the post-COVID world that we're looking forward to lies incredibly communicating those collective narratives, at least where we concur that history may be salutary. Thank you. <laughs> now I can all see you again. Thanks very much, Peter. So, um, <clears throat> I think now comes the opportunity for discussion uh, and uh, Lindsay and the, the team have been sending through various questions that are coming through, so excuse me for referring to my um, phone as we go through. But Peter, first one from Susan Pond here. Um, what lessons from the past should we have learned that would have improved our readiness for COVID-19 pandemic? As you can imagine, I've been asked that question many times this year, particularly in relation to 1919. And I always like to actually bring it back to a positive message. And uh, interestingly enough, this was the message that I encouraged community historians to deliver in 2018, 2019, before we'd ever heard of coronavirus, which was that 100 years ago, our community actually pulled itself together. This was an era in 1919 before there was a Commonwealth Department of Health, before state uh, departments of health had any major powers apart from those of compulsory detention and surveillance of diseases. Most hospitals around our community in 1919 were run at a community level, either through voluntary organisations or charities or churches. There were some that were run by the state at that time and gradually that process accelerated in the 1920s and 1930s. But primarily in the face of a pandemic that infected up to 30% of the population here in New South Wales, the community had to fall back on itself. Local councils were actually at the forefront of that. Local government was really a very important force 100 years ago. And councils actually did do a lot of preparatory work and assisted their citizens. They helped organise things like relief depots where soup and blankets and clean clothes and care of children could be organised at a very community level if parents or partners were sick. But ultimately it was those local people, neighbours, family members, church congregations, members of other community groups who were the ones who came to the fore in 1919. They had to. So it was organisations like the Red Cross or the Anglican Church who actually stepped up and helped manage the pandemic because of two things. Firstly, we didn't organise our health system in the same way. We didn't think it was the role of our government to look after us a century ago. And secondly, because of the impact of the pandemic itself, it selectively affected younger people aged 20 to 40 years. I'm out of that age bracket now, thank goodness. But it selectively targeted those people. Well, I shouldn't say targeted, but they were the ones who suffered the most severely. So it took out the main part of the medical and community workforce at the time and forced a disruption in social functioning at a time of crisis. So it meant that people were called upon to act in extraordinary ways in that time. So I think that's a very positive message we can take out of the past. And I've tended to see that spirit emerging this year as well. Of course, we've seen instances of defiance and selfishness, foolishness even, but we've also, I think, broadly seen people who have willingly self-isolated, who've chalked rainbows on the footpath or put teddy bears in their, their front windows in order to share messages of hope and solidarity and a willingness to put up with whatever we can. Of course, the major difference this year in contrast with 1919 is that our government has stepped in and made enormous strides, of course, created an enormous paying forward burden of uh, taxation for us to deal with. But it does mean that we've actually looked to our government much more severely. So one of the lessons I think we should take out of this is actually to look again 
and think about the power of our communities. And particularly, not only uh, some of the, the community members that Her Excellency mentioned earlier in terms of um, the way that people are being disenfranchised and disempowered this year, but also those groups who turned out to be intrinsic to the fact that we could stay at home, like the Deliveroo and Uber Eats cyclists who went in a weather like this to bring pizzas to our doors so that we could stay at home comfortably and not transmit the disease. And I think there are people like that in our society who on the one hand could be seen as vectors, but on the other hand could be seen as unrecognised heroes of 2020. Thank you, Peter. Um, so before I ask the next question, just to remind um, everyone uh, that if you'd like to ask a question, please do send an email through forum2020 Q&A at royalsociety.org.au or use the QR code. This is a great opportunity for those um, online, but if uh, otherwise, if we need to pull some questions from the floor, I'm also happy to do that. Peter, next question, Eugene Lumbers. Um, when did the concept of risk to benefit ratio come to be applied in clinical management uh, for patients? Ooh, now that's a good question. Look, the concept of risk really was a largely 20th century uh, uh, innovation. And my understanding is that really that risk to benefit ratio, I mean, it would, the concept was there for a long time. I'm very conscious that my colleague Warwick Anderson, who's Australia's foremost historian of medicine, is in, in the audience. Um, my feeling of the, the a formalization of the risk to benefit ratio coming into clinical medicine was actually surprisingly late. The concept was there, but I think it really tended to be operationalized in the 1980s. I mean, I'd be happy to hear Warwick's view on this, and I'd also be keen to hear uh, Emeritus Professor Robert Clancy's view on this, because he was very much a clinician through that period as well. But I think in terms of formal developments in risk to benefit ratio, and then its, its transformation into you know, new developments like evidence-based medicine, which really was a concept of the 1990s, I would argue it was in those late decades of the 20th century. Terrific, thanks, Peter. And so just maybe building on what you were saying before, you, you invited yourself into a, a question about the Spanish flu. Do you want to maybe take an opportunity to share with people and into discussion your observations there and its connection? Mm. One of the other questions I'm frequently asked about Spanish flu, I tend not to like calling it that because it points blame at the Spanish who pointedly were not to blame for it. And that's why I'm so glad this year we don't call it the Wuhan virus, you know, that we, the World Health Organization very pointedly gave it a neutral name. And I think that's one of the advances that we've, we've developed over the last hundred years because you can easily label a community unfairly. So I do tend to call it the, the pneumonic influenza pandemic. That's actually quite an Australian usage. It was the official terminology used for that particular form of influenza mandated by the Commonwealth government in 1918. So around the rest of the world, they don't tend to know what we mean when we talk about pneumonic influenza. But one of the other points I like to make about the 1919 is the importance of quarantine. Now, we've seen that playing out this year. We've seen it playing out at three main scales, national, state and domestic. And I think we saw those same scales in 1919, but we have to remember that 100 years ago, it was the federal government. The government was there as the nominal head of a federation of former colonies who'd become states. And the really, the power that we now understand the Commonwealth having didn't really evolve until the dramatic transformations of the Second World War and their massively increased revenue base from taxation during that conflict. So the federal government in 1919 was much weaker and had a much more limited range of powers and a much more limited ability to enforce them than we would expect today. So it meant that the states, the old colonies, were actually much more powerful in 1919 than we might expect. But quarantine played out at those three levels. Broadly, the Commonwealth was responsible for international quarantine, at that point, maritime quarantine. The first aircraft to land in Australia from overseas arrived in December 1919, just a few months after the pandemic was declared to be over in Australia. So we're talking about maritime quarantine. Now, on one hand, you could say that maritime quarantine failed. The disease came ashore. But it succeeded in two ways. One we understand and one I don't think we appreciate enough. The first was the fact that it did help keep out pneumonic influenza from Australia for three critical months at the end of 1918. So, for instance, the flu was probably at its most virulent and deadly at exactly that moment when World War I came to an end. It went ashore in New Zealand in 1918, and the death rate in New Zealand was four times what it was in Australia. Our maritime quarantine kept the disease out until January 1919, and by then, the nature of the virus had itself 
changed. It had been somewhat attenuated. So we actually had a less deadly version came ashore three months later than our colleagues across the Tasman saw in 1918. So that was one success of quarantine in that period. The other one that we don't tend to appreciate is that the maritime quarantine was kept up. When a disease comes ashore, you don't just throw open the gates and say, OK, bring it on. The maritime quarantine was kept up, just as it's being kept up this year, because you don't need to increase the caseload and you don't want to run the risk of the virus mutating again and introducing yet more virulent strains into the population. So the maintenance of quarantine was actually important then, and I think it has been today. Now, the second concern that's come up is this issue of state powers, state jealousies, and the way they've played out over this year, but also again in 1919. Now, look, there was a lot of factional fighting, political point scoring in 1919. States did close their borders against each other, not always for medical reasons. But nevertheless, I think the impact was there. And again, we've seen it this year. Yes, we can say it's silly or it's arbitrary, but it does still limit the movement of the disease through limiting the movement of people. And it had an impact in 1919, just as it did again today. By slowing the spread of disease and helping it ameliorate over time, in 1919 and in 2020, I think we have actually helped reduce at least the acceleration of the disease, if not necessarily the caseload. Of course, we can't know how the caseload would have gone, but I think if we look overseas, we've got some pretty good indicators as well. And so finally, that third scale of quarantine uh, comes down to our individual choices. You know, we're citizens, most of us wish to obey the law and the recommendations of our government, but in 1919 and 2020, a lot of us were quite confused about exactly what the latest measures were. When should we wear a mask? When should we stay at home? Does it matter if somebody comes to our door to deliver a pizza? Does it matter if we go out and walk the dog or go and get a coffee? All of us had to face these individual decisions every day, particularly in the dark days in the first half of this year. And I think broadly, our community 100 years ago and today have actually embodied most of the public health messages that we would like to see in ways that we haven't necessarily seen playing out overseas. So I think, again, I like to talk it up and actually say that there are salutary parallels that we can draw between now and then. I don't know how much our behaviour in 2020 was influenced by an understanding of 1919. I think most people, you know, broad, more broadly, had never heard of that pandemic. But it's interesting to see that pattern playing out again. And I think it says a lot about the nature of the society we've built and the social capital that we love and invest in here in Australia. Thanks, Peter. So maybe building on that a little further, uh, we have another question here from Peter Tyree, uh, which goes to the question of technology. And I think technology may emerge as one of the cross-cutting themes today and is the topic of our next session. He says here, we learn yet again that we learn from history. Have you got any thoughts on using technology to help us learn before we enter into catch-up mode uh, by failing to recall or be aware of history? Hmm. Technology is always a, a tricky element and having sort of moved across from history of medicine into history of technology, I still don't necessarily feel entirely across that field. But I think one of the, uh, one of the major points about technology is we tend to focus on novelty. We focus on the new, the cutting edge, the latest developments, and we often forget two things. Firstly, that the history of technology is littered with failures or has-beens or nearly made-its. That's not to dismiss the true transformative power of new technologies like Wi-Fi, like uh, cell phones and so on. But it does mean that we can focus on innovation at the expense of thinking about the everyday as well. Um, so that's, I think that's one cautionary note, I guess, about technology. But I think also for historians, it's dangerous for us to think about the impact of technology going forward, because of course, we are not trained. You know, I've said this year several times, I'm trained to look backwards, not forwards. And technology can change the way that we think about the future. And I think particularly the technology that to me may make the most difference is data. Uh, you know, that I think I've, I've suggested already in some of the things I published this year that you know, archiving collections, state libraries, national archives and so on, have been gathering often paper ephemera from this year. They want the signs that went up in shop windows saying, sorry, closed due to the pandemic. That's fine, but that's a 19th century idea of archiving. When you think about the way we understand people behaving in 2020, we're all about connection. And so these collecting institutions have been asking us to tell our own stories, to document our own experiences and collect our own ephemera from, the, from 2020. 
But actually, I think one of the lessons we've taken out of this year is actually not how isolated and sad and lonely we are, but actually how connected we are, certainly in contrast with 1919, where people really had to rely on town meetings in the context of a pandemic or newspapers. There was no wireless, very few people had telephones, there was certainly no internet and no cell phones or mobile phones in 1919. So I think this year has actually emphasised just how important technology has been to connecting us, to providing us outreach, but also to helping us connect with the services that we need to get through the crisis. But of course, that technology is generating vast amounts of data. Now, one of my research projects has actually been going back to the history of data, and I've gone back to the computing technologies of the 1940s, actually in the context of aviation accidents and early attempts at what you could call data processing, using machines, like physical machines, to process data through punched cards as the very origins of computing before electronic computers came around. And I see the emergence of that systematisation of people as data, but also then the reading back of that data onto individuals and the prediction of their behaviour as well. And I think, you know, there's that wonderful possibility of collating data from this year, the way we moved, the way we interacted, the way we messaged each other. That can all come out of the ways that we gather information in our current moment. But of course, it still requires the technology to actually read and make sense of that information. We can gather all the data we like, but unless we can see the patterns and make sense of it, then where is that going? And of course, I'm not a scholar of artificial intelligence, so I can't speak to whether we can hold promise in you know, entities larger than ourselves, actually being able to make sense of human behaviour at a collective as well as an individual level. But I do think there's still a place for humans in the loop to be actually interpreting the sorts of insights that this massive amount of big data can generate from 2020. Thanks, Peter. So then building on that again, uh, you talk about data, but in your remarks, you also talk a bit about our history. And you say that uh, in our history, part of the culture of how we've analysed data has been scientific, uh, a, a value for hypothesis and the scientific method and a positivist view of that. Um, Christina Slade says that in this crisis, though, we've seen scientific evidence being sidelined from the pandemic. And so the question, I suppose, is are we becoming immune to scientific evidence or is that part of our history less easy to ignore? Mm -hmm. It's an interesting point and, of course, we're all um, very aware of current circumstances in another large continent on the other side of the world and the way in which uninformed opinion uh, can drive public behaviour as well. One of the reasons I gave the illustration of country folk attaching ticks to their dogs was to emphasise that sometimes innovations can be adopted at very quotidian levels. And that sometimes what we think is high science actually plays out at the level of individual people picking up an idea and running with it. And I saw that a lot in my studies of snake bite. You see it less in the aviation industry for logical reasons. The industry requires a massive investment in technology in the way that, for instance, individual behaviour in the face of disease or snake bite doesn't. I've also looked at some of the history of the anti-vaccination movement in Australia. And I, you know, I trained as a pharmacologist in the 1990s. I do have an understanding of, some degree of understanding of immunology. And I believe in immunisation. And in fact, you know, one of, the, one of the ironies this year was I got my flu shot. And when the pharmacist had finished jabbing me, he couldn't see where to put the Band-Aid because the gauge of the needle was so fine that he couldn't actually tell where he stabbed me. And I thought that was a major dilemma because when you vaccinated people against smallpox in the 19th century, you would leave a suppurating wound about the size of a 10 to 20 cent piece. So you could very clearly see when someone being vaccinated and it was unpleasant. It looked unpleasant, probably smelled unpleasant. And it also made people feel off colour for a day or two. So vaccination in the 19th century against smallpox was a much more unpleasant process than we experience today. But as a historian of medicine, I've always been much less willing to dismiss anti-vaxxers as being mindless or anti-information. They often have their own reasons, and those reasons are often to do with their presumed civil liberties. They want to have, you know, they want to maintain integrity over their own body and their own actions and their own relations with their government. And you know, I'm reminded, in fact, when I walked past the old Department of Health building this morning, if you ever st stand and look in front of it, it's now the Sir Stanford Hotel, and ironically, the old Board of Health uh, Laboratories are now a whiskey bar. Excellent. Um, but if you look across the entranceway, you'll see the crest of the Board of Health, and there's a, a motto above it. 
uh, Salus Populi Suprema Lex. The quote should be Salus Populi Suprema Lex Esto, and apologies a thousandfold to my appalling Latin. But the welfare of the community is the supreme law. Now that's a motto from Cicero, Roman jurist, but it embodies a particularly political view of where we should stand in terms of individual rights and the community. The supreme law is the health of the community or the welfare of the community. Now individuals have the right to contest that in our society, but whether they had the right to contest it in the face of a pandemic where they themselves may be a vector and a cause for spreading a disease that can harm or kill other people is one of those dilemmas that we have faced this year and will continue to face into the future as well. So look, I do give credit to people for having opinions, particularly if they have some rationale behind it. I'm obviously less enamoured of people who take somebody else's manufactured opinion because they don't have the time or the willingness to think about it for themselves. Thanks, Peter. So I think we probably have time for one or two more questions. Um, one from me actually here, just while we're waiting for um, a final one to come through. You talked a little bit about the history of aviation and also the history of pandemics. I wondered if you could say something about the connection between these two in the sense of how mm -hmm. second and third wave uh, recurrences happen and the pace at which those happen. We're obviously very mobile because of aviation and other technology. Some of that has stopped, but mm -hmm. is there something about the speed and nature of recurrence that we can learn from history? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things we need to understand as Australians is that we live on an island continent. Of course, we all know that, but it did have a major impact in the way we think about quarantine uh, in our colonies and then in this country as well, because, you know, the sailing voyage to Australia from the United States, from China and from Europe took a long time. It could take four to six months in the early days of colonisation to sail from the United Kingdom to Australia. But with the advent of new technologies like steamships, that time was dramatically reduced. But steamships also brought with them a different technological problem. They needed coal and they needed lots of it and they needed it regularly so that instead of steaming non-stop from San Francisco or Vancouver or from Canton or from Plymouth, these ships had to stop along the way to recoal. And in doing that, of course, they had people coming and going on shore. So they were getting here more quickly, but they were also increasing the chance of contact with other infected places along the way when epidemics or pandemics were rife. And that meant two things. Firstly, the risk of disease being on board ships was increased if it wasn't being transmitted amongst the people who'd, who'd uh, on, uh, come on board when they'd first departed. The second was that these vessels sailed more quickly and therefore arrived in Australia sooner from those last points of call, say Hong Kong or Batavia, what's now Jakarta, for instance, or Auckland or Cape Town. So there was an escalation in the risk of disease being transmitted to Australia long before aircraft came on the scene. But when that first aeroplane did touch down in Darwin in uh, December 1919, the Vickers Vimy, former bomber, lands at Darwin Airport, the quarantine authorities basically had to gallop out to the aeroplane and do a quick maritime quarantine check of the aviators because this was an unprecedented development. They knew the aircraft was coming, but of course they had no system or no procedure for dealing with the fact that these aviators could be bringing a disease in from what we now call Indonesia, what was then the Dutch East Indies, in a matter of hours. Interestingly, when we developed uh, quarantine laws specifically to deal with aircraft, I think it was 1934, the main concern was not infected human passengers. Anyone want to venture what they were more concerned about? Sorry? Mosquitoes. There was a concern that insects, arthropod vectors of disease, might come on board aircraft at local ports. And of course, as aircraft became bigger and had longer ranges, those, those ports of call could be further and further away. But our first aviation-specific uh, quarantine laws were actually directed against arthropods. And in fact, I still remember as a young boy uh, coming home from overseas and you'd uh, have the cabin crew walking up and down the hallway spraying, you know, I don't know, Mortein or something like that in an attempt to kill mosquitoes or God knows what they thought, there were fleas that might be on board as well. So that practice persevered for a long time. So I wonder if I've lost the point of the question in that series of, of <laughs> anecdotes, but I think the point is here, yeah, the two cross over sometimes in unexpected ways. So yes, we've understood the fact that aviation can rapidly change the nature of infected diseases. And it certainly, for instance, it made our quarantine stations redundant. The idea of a mass quarantine of hundreds of people 
who'd come off a ship was rendered redundant by the fact that a disease could arrive in, um, in Sydney, for instance, in just a few hours. And so to give one example of that, Sydney's North Head Quarantine Station was established in 1832. It was gazetted then as a quarantine ground, mainly because of the risk of cholera, which was a, an awful disease that was pandemic in the 1830s. But cholera never made it into Australia until 1971, and it came in on a Qantas flight. So, you know, the, those things that we think we're protected against actually are not necessarily true. So, um, yeah, aviation certainly has changed disease practice, but I think we've actually seen a reversion to older practices. Curiously enough, the quarantine station, uh, the people who run the quarantine station, who are my, my friends and colleagues, they offered up their facility for use again as a quarantine station this year, and they were rejected. And I think actually, ironically enough, because it's so large and sprawling, it's actually incredibly hard to police a massive headland at the entrance to Sydney Harbour. And until we heard what happened in Victoria, it was believed to be easier to police the entrances to a major city hotel instead. Thanks, Peter. I think uh, losing our way is all part of the fun of and the conversation. So look, final question from Warwick Anderson, um, which is you've spoken a lot about what history has to say about the pandemic, but I wondered if you could reflect on how the pandemic might shape ways we do history. Uh, what do historians have to learn from this pandemic? Mm -hmm. And we might close with this one. Yeah. Thanks, Warwick. And thanks for not posing anything too horrendously curly. So Warwick really is an extraordinary historian of immun uh, immunology. So uh, thank you. Um, how will it change? Look, I think, you know, I've argued in a, a review that I published a few months ago that one thing historians need to face is what we've called the digital abyss. So we were aware of it from the 1990s. And I can speak from personal experience about this. I moved to Sydney when I finished my, my schooling at the University of Melbourne in the mid-1990s. I moved here in 1995. That year, my company instituted email. And so the very first emails that I ever received, I printed out and kept because I thought they were like letters. And I did the same with faxes. I don't know that the thermal paper from those faxes has anything left on it now. Within six months, I'd stopped printing out those emails and I just allowed them to vanish into the ether. I doubt that any of them are recoverable now. We recognised in the historical profession, even by the end of the 1990s, that this was an escalating process, that people were not writing to each other, they weren't sending letters or postcards or even faxes, they were sending emails. And the proliferation of those emails, and often the inanity of them, and the lack of formality in them meant that they didn't feel that they were worth retaining. Of course, some people have, but broadly, they haven't been retained. So we refer to that as the digital abyss. There's a cliff in about 1996 where physical documentation of our interaction with each other falls off. And of course, that's then accentuated by smartphones, texting, social media, and so on as well. Now, of course, there are scholars who've been scraping and archiving social media at an aggregate level as well as individually. So one of the things I've actually thought about this year is we really need to face that in light of the way we understand the way this pandemic has played out this year, the way we stayed in touch with each other, the way we kept track, the way we connected, the way we delivered services, the way our government at our Commonwealth but also local level tried to keep tabs on us for our own good, as they said. All of these things are born digital and remain digital. Now, I, I worked last year at the National Archives of Australia where they do take digital archiving very seriously. They act actively go out and contact Commonwealth government agencies and seek data that can then be permanently archived. And they're very serious about maintaining the longevity of that. But many of our other collecting institutions, let alone our local council historical centres or our local historical societies, aren't in a position technologically to do that. And they're hanging on to these older practices of keeping paperwork or physical ephemera. And I think we're actually going to see, just as we see looking back at 1919, when there's a great dearth of council records, school records, personal correspondence, there's a big emptiness in the, in the physical records of 1919 because people were sick and, and services were so disrupted. I think we're actually going to have to face the fact that maybe this will spur us to think differently as historians about how we engage with data and how we have to actually advocate for its gathering and its archiving and its accessibility despite all of the security concerns and personal privacy concerns, so that 50 years from now, or even 20 years from now, historians can write the history of 2020.
Well, Peter, thank you so much for setting us up so well this morning and grounding us in history. Uh, I think this is a great moment for us to now break and have morning tea, and I think that when we come back, we'll be talking a little bit about our future and technology. Um, so for now, please, if you're online, uh, go find uh, a coffee or a tea. Um, uh, for those who are in the room, I think there might be uh, uh, some coffee and tea just beyond this door, but if we can all just join uh, and thanking Peter for setting us up for today's discussion. Thank you.